Welcome to First Date, a panel talk show on the Reader Seeks Romance channel that celebrates debut romance authors with recent and upcoming releases. I am your matchmaking host, Liz Donatelli. It is a thrill for me to introduce four new romance authors who will set your hearts aflutter with their 2023 fall debut romances. Amelia Jones is the author of The Stage Kiss, pub date December 12th. Katrina Kwan is the author of Knives, Seasoning, and A Dash of Love, pub date December 19th. Talia Samuels is the author of The Christmas Swap, pub date October 10th. Joe Segura is the author of Raiders of the Lost Heart, pub date December 5th. Welcome authors and congratulations on your debut romance releases. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Okay, well, let's begin, as all first dates do, with an icebreaker. Tell me something about yourself that others would be surprised to learn. I love cross-stitching. Like, oh. I, I love cross-stitching. I love crocheting. I've made quilts. So we call them, like, granny sports. So <laughs> my great passions in life when I'm not like completely binge writing a book or editing or whatever is if I like I'm completely in a mess of writer's block for a period of time, right. it's just all out hours and hours and hours of cross stitching. Love it. Wow. My grandmother taught me how I'm really, really good. <laughs> wow. Now, have you created any cross stitch or, or quilt um, items to promote your debut, The Stage Kiss? No, I totally should do that, though. I hadn't even thought of that. <laughs> That's a great idea. I would not have, have guessed <laughs> um, that you are a prolific cross-stitcher quilter. Yeah. Katrina, what's something oh, no. you would be surprised to learn about you? I think something people might be surprised to know is that I'm also an actress based out of Vancouver. Um, mostly bit parts right now, but you got to work your way up. Absolutely. And I've been doing it for... What year is it? About three years. Nice. So you started during the pandemic? Yeah, it was crazy. So I turned 25 in January of 2020. And I'm like, this is my year. I'm going to do something I've always wanted to do. And then, oops. Wow. Um, <laughs> so it was a very interesting time to get into it because yeah. nobody knew what was going what was going on, how things would work. And right. yeah, just got to learn on the fly. Vancouver is like the Hollywood of Canada, because um, that's where a lot of things are filmed. Like a lot of. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. have you ever auditioned for or been in any Hallmark movies? Because Hallmark does a lot of Vancouver filming. Um, I actually just finished um, a Hallmark movie called. Oh, no, I've forgotten it. It's on my IMDb. Oh, okay. um, it just recently aired and I was on it and I just booked another part for another Hallmark movie <gasps> as well. Yeah. That is fantastic. Does anyone watch Hallmark movies or do you feel like, eh, you're over it? Okay, Joe's shaking her head. Oh, yeah. Okay, now, Talia, I'm guessing you don't have access to Hallmark movies, correct? Uh, no, they'll, like, occasionally be on, like, channel 503 kind of thing over here like you would have to work so hard to find them but I think they are here okay. they're just it's not like front page of I don't know Netflix or I don't know where you guys get them I don't it's a channel right yes it's a cable channel yeah so it's not something that I mean if it was on Netflix it would be easier to find obviously does the UK have a version of the Hallmark channel where they have a lot of sentimental, sweet romance stories. No. No, massively not the kind of thing you'd find here. We have like, you know, ITV, which is just like back-to-back -back gritty crime dramas is like yes. the closest thing. We have to like a channel with a dedicated mood and it is not sentimental. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wow. Joe, what is something that we would be surprised to learn about you? I'm a really clumsy, klutzy person. I injure myself very easily. Mm. And so I think people are surprised to know that I used to be a dancer. <laughs> I used to be uh, a Mexican folk dancer. You can see okay. my little yes. folk dancer back here. Um, and so like my husband, he at one point tried to teach me how to play tennis because he's a really good tennis player. Yeah. And I was terrible. And he's like, how can you not do this? You used to be a dancer right. you were very coordinated when you danced why 
why is the ball over here and the rackets out here? But, you know, we all have different ways that we carry out those talents. And mine, you know, my my talent for movement is not with sports. Okay. Talia, what is something that we would be surprised to learn about you? I think in the context of being here to speak about my book, which is a lesbian Christmas book, I guess it would be that I'm a Jew with a boyfriend. Um, Kind of seems a bit random, Um, but I'm, you know, culturally Jewish, religiously Jewish, but kind of celebrated Christmas growing up just because my mum was like, hey, it's fun. Why not? Um, And then I'm bisexual. So I'll write about my community. I just happen to have a boyfriend. But yeah, I guess if you were, if you knew me only from being like, oh, that's that person that wrote that one book, you would be kind of surprised by um, (laughs) those facts. Let me set the scene. You have just scored a meeting with book club tastemakers, Oprah, Jenna Bush Hager, and Reese Witherspoon. They are giving you two minutes to pitch your debut romance to them. Go. Talia, whenever you're ready to get in the room with Oprah, Jenna, and uh, Reese, let me know. So the Christmas swap is about Margot, who is going through a horrible breakup in the lead up to Christmas. She has no one to spend the holidays with. So her client slash kind of friend, Ben, who is hopelessly single, invites her to pretend to be his girlfriend for the holidays so she can spend Christmas in his beautiful manor house in the countryside. Um, English countryside, of course. Um, And she agrees. She's thinking, oh, it sounds a little bit sappy. I don't want to fall in love with anyone for real, but no bother. I'm a lesbian. It's never going to happen in a million years. So it's all good. It's not going to go the way that the Hallmark films go. Um, And then she turns up. She meets his sister, absolute woman of her dreams, and chaos ensues. So she's faking a relationship. She's maybe starting a real relationship with his sister. and that's what's going on in the Christmas song. Next, Raiders of the Lost Heart is about two rival archaeologists, Dr. Socorro Corey Mejia and Dr. Ford Matthews. Uh, Dr. Mejia's lifelong dream is to go on an archaeological expedition to search for her Aztec ancestors' remains. When she's finally given the opportunity to do so, she shows up in Mexico and finds out that the dig is actually being led by none other than her grad school rival, Ford Matthews. Typical. Uh, So she can't give up this opportunity because she cannot allow him to win and have his name in all the history books next to this important discovery. So she decides to stick around the expedition and help him out. And of course, along the way, there's only one ten. Next. Have you ever watched Hulu's The Bear or Gordon Ramsay's Hell's Kitchen and thought, this would be interesting as a rom-com? Well, my debut adult rom-com, Knives Seasoning and a Dash of Love, is basically that. We've got head chef Alexander Chen. He He's an iron chef. He accepts nothing less than perfection. And we've also got Eden Monroe, uh, his newly hired sous chef, who may or may have not lied on her resume to get the job. We've got uh, workplace drama, sabotage, and along the way, a little dash of love. Next. So I am Amelia Jones, and I wrote a book called The Stage Kiss. And I wanted to add also that in the UK, it's going to be enemies to lovers. Same book. And as you see on the UK cover, it says Pride and Prejudice Retold. So I know I know there's a lot of these. We've got a lot of Pride and Prejudice retellings in the world. But what I wanted to do here, Reese, Oprah, and Jenna, was um, to do an actual beat-for-beat beat retelling of Pride and Prejudice in a contemporary setting using um, a theatrical version of <laughs> Pride and Prejudice uh, as a musical and having the characters then play out in different roles, the actual story of Pride and Prejudice. This is a a touring Broadway musical. So they have brought in uh, one of the legends of Broadway, Brennan Thorne, to play Darcy, 
for uh, I think six weeks um, or three months. Three months. Uh, they bring in Brennan to play Darcy, and of course uh, they meet at an after party before he takes the lead and have a terrible first impression. And um, then the lead, who Eden is the standby for, goes missing and uh, ends up she's not going to be finishing out the run. So Eden now has to work with Brennan. And the catch is they now have to kiss each other on stage eight shows a week. So um, they are the Liz and Darcy of the book, but every other character plays one character on stage, but represents another character in the narrative. So it's a lot of fun. It is literally uh, Pride and Prejudice. So <laughs> what, that, first of all, that's very ambitious. I thought so. Yeah, <laughs> it was my, you, this is my pandemic book. <laughs> I know that a lot of books have different covers between the US and the UK because of the the different way readers respond to the book cover. But I, I rarely find that the title has to be changed. Yeah, they changed um, the title. They're they're really working on their um I what is it called? There's some kind of uh search engine optimization seo <laughs> okay i was gonna say are they becoming more tropey readers in the uk and that's why something like that because i mean the us we've been obsessed with tropes i think for a little while now sure. um but um, I, I spoke to some uk romance authors recently and it seems like they were just starting to get into tropes where that would sell books so and I don't know, maybe I could be wrong about that. So I guess they're really going tropey there. Uh, really interesting. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Joe, could you read the first line of Readers of the Lost Heart? Yes. A thousand and one percent. Yes. Oh, well, so far that sounds promising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. okay. Um, Amelia, now I have an idea of the first line. You because would be wrong. I <laughs> oh, will I? Because I have not second paragraph. What <laughs> but was I that? want to read that to you too. Okay. I saved it for the second paragraph. You saved I did it for not the start with, I, I knew you were going to say that. Okay, because I have uh, talked to many uh, uh, an author who wrote retellings of Pride and Prejudice, and the first line is that iconic first. Okay. If there were such a thing as Broadway royalty, Brennan Thorne was the king, and tonight his majesty would make his long-awaited first appearance. Intriguing. So far, very intriguing first lines. Talia. So, you and I have been together for five months, I say to the man I met four days ago. Oh, intriguing. I love first lines. Katrina. Control. That's what he likes the most about running his own kitchen. Oh, that's intriguing and uh, sexy. Yeah, isn't there something sexy about chefs? There is. There's just something wonderful about a man who knows how to feed you. <laughs> yeah, I feel like everything you're saying, there's like a sexual innuendo. <laughs> <laughs> Very good first lines, everyone. Now, I know some of you mentioned this a little bit when you were talking to Oprah, Jenna, and Reese, uh, but if you could re, uh, reiterate which tropes you use to tell the love story between your main characters. Also, please share if there are any tropes, like Only One Tent, that you have created uh, and would like to claim as your own. So if there's anything, you know, unique, that happens that you would like to say, you know what? I'm claiming this. This is a trope. It's mine now. Uh, you have to do it here on Reader Seeks Romance. Otherwise, it does not count. Let's see. Uh, Amelia. Okay. So obviously, enemies to lovers, as the UK title implies. So yes. I'll, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a, it's, it's a showmance. So um, I don't know if this is old or new, but this is definitely like a showmance. This is... Uh, forced proximity because they are working together and they have to kiss each other eight shows a week they're on tour together we've got kind of an uptown boy downtown girl situation that's sort of the class difference that i created mm -hmm. yeah. um and then uh i have honey as an aphrodisiac honey yes really? honey that plays a big role in the story and then but more importantly the bigger role is played um by uh this is going to get a little saucy. I have sort of the Brennan's erection is a secondary character. 
it really has a mind of its own. It really propels the narrative in ways that like it has to be its own trope. So erection is a secondary character. <laughs> if that gives you any idea of like my sense of humor. Okay, I'm curious to know, does the honey come before the erection? Is it like honey yes. and then he... <laughs> yes. It's like a trigger. <laughs> I don't even... Who wants to follow that? Who wants to follow that? Um, I, I don't think I'm able to get that out of my... Is it raw honey? Is oh, it yeah. wildflower honey? What is it? Oh, well, any kind of honey. Honey for tea, mainly. It's honey for tea. Okay. I'm glad it, you helps, it helps the actress's throat. Oh, right. Yeah. Now, yeah. see, we put honey in tea. Talia, being you uh, are from the UK, do you put honey in your tea or is it usually just milk and sugar lumps? I feel like you guys use sugar lumps, right? Like, like. For sure. I, yeah, I'd say milk and sugar more common. Sugar lumps would be like if you were out for tea, then you have a little bowl of sugar lumps. If you're having okay. your tea at home, you're like digging your teaspoon into a sack of sugar it's not as civilized as okay. um, people might think it is but yeah okay. not frequently honey but I'm sure some people do well being Talia we've been talking together right now why don't you um tell us about tropes new and old uh in the Christmas swap I would say some classic tropes in here is of course fake dating is the headline um and then kind of my best friend's sister type thing um, and then in terms of a newish, oldish trope, I'd say it's kind of an enemies to lovers, but it's one sided. So Ben's sister, who Margot ha fancies, um, is attracted to immediately upon seeing her, is deeply suspicious of Margot. She actually she can sense that something's wrong in the fake relationship. Um, and she thinks that it's because Margot is a gold digger. So she doesn't like her. She wants her out of the house ASAP. Um, so she kind of hates her, but Margot immediately likes her. So I think it's kind of a fun twist on enemies to lovers in that one of them doesn't know their enemies, um, which oh, is, yeah, yeah, something a bit new, maybe. I think that's new. Um, I'll tell you one thing, if even if it's not new, I don't think there's a name for it as mm. a, an officially recognized trope. So maybe one-sided enemies maybe would be the name of the trope. Okay. All right. One-sided enemies it is because I declare it so. Joe, now being, now I find it really fascinating. Um, romance adventure. Is this kind of a, an emerging subgenre? Is this romantic adventure? Because we have romantic suspense, but this is specifically like, you know, uh, a fantastical adventure of sorts. I hope it's an emerging genre. I haven't, there haven't been a ton of um, books that I have seen that have this type of, you know, rom-com uh, adventure, like mm -hmm. movies like Romancing the Stone, uh, The Lost City, mm -hmm. you know, so, like, the mummy, those types of things in books recently, but I have been hearing a lot of people um, who are currently working on those books or books that are going to be released um, right. within the near future. So I'm super excited because this is one of my favorite genres of movies, but there aren't a bunch of books about it that are romance. And so I right. am so here for it. Yeah, no, I was really, I mean, I was, I remember watching Romancing the Stone and Jewel of the Nile, the sequel, when I was a kid. And, you know, I just loved it. And I love the movie The Lost City. I mean, yes. I rewatch it over and over and over again. But um, Lost yeah. City, I will, I'm just going to keep saying it over and over again, needed yes. more kissing. Yeah, you know, I I feel like they pulled back. Like they wanted to go there, but they mm -hmm. pulled back on the physical intimacy. And yeah. I was wondering wondering if it was just because Channing Tatum and Sandra Bullock maybe didn't want maybe they're such good friends they didn't really want to kiss each other that much. Like, I don't know. Or do you think it's because they thought if it's too much kissing, it wouldn't appeal to as many people? I don't know. Right? I, don't know. I mean, been more she was kissing. a romance author. Right. And so, I mean, it it's clearly capturing the romance genre. Yeah. Um, and they had like the whole thing with Brad Pitt and how, you know, she yes. was feeling that. Yeah. And they had some really great, like sexy moments. Yes. Um, 
like and the some tender moments like the night that they yeah. spend together by the campfire really tender moments yeah but they're just there needed to be more kissing it was kind of like a hallmark yeah. movie which i love a hallmark movie but i yeah. also wish hallmark movies had more kissing right right does, does has anyone else seen the lost city and uh, thought boy there should be more kissing yeah or at least more more touching more heat <laughs> more heat yeah uh so go ahead uh, joe if you could share new and old tropes that appear in raiders of the lost heart clearly there's an enemies or rivals to lovers trope really strong in this book uh i mean ellie hazelwood says the ultimate enemies to lovers adventure rom-com on the cover so it is so um there's also (laughs) only one tent i'm not going to claim only one tent i'm sure someone else has done it okay force proximity uh he falls first uh those are a little bit of second chance you know they are former grad school um classmates who had a little bit of something happening and it's alluded Mm -hmm. to many many times um, in the book, and they both think about that t- that night in the library. Um, oh. As far as a trope that I invented, I'm going to say I invented the snake maneuvers trope. Uh, so there are some shenanigans involving a snake, and so I'm going to claim that because I don't think we see too many snake maneuvers in uh, romance books, but there's one in here. Well, th- that's yours now snake maneuver you know it's funny how animals and pets are making you know they're usually a sidekick in a lot of romances you know and some have chickens cows goats you know dogs cats um but i feel like mentioning a snake in any capacity in a romance is like ooh. but there's a maneuver is it to remove a snake not yeah so i really wanted uh (laughs) there's there's a lot of um mention of indiana jones in this Ah, book okay indiana jones was one of my inspirations i love indiana jones um and anyone who is familiar with indy knows that his biggest fear is of snakes and so i wanted to have something that involved a snake Mm -hmm. and uh you know maybe a little little uh rescuing that involved the snakes okay all right intriguing katrina I had to pull up a list because I genuinely <laughs> forgot it's been a while. Is since that why you it. put yourself on mute? You were doing a little research? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> um, the big one is grumpy and sunshine. That's their whole dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've also got a subcategory of that dynamic where the grumpy right here is only soft for her. Okay. Um, we've got obviously workplace romance. I have Asian leading man. I don't know if that's a trope so much as a fact. Um, so we've got some Asian rep in here. We've got, I'm claiming no third act breakup. It's a, it's a personal yeah. preference of mine that, yeah. you know, it's getting a little, not predictable, but you know, I'm just throwing that out there. Gotcha. There's communication in here, um, safe sex conversations and just, uh, oh, obviously in keeping with the title, uh, food as a love language. Food is a love language. Yeah. Nice, nice. Okay. Now, I was when you said uh, that he's only soft for her. I was gonna say, oh yeah, that's only soft for her should be a trope. But I think if it's a guy saying I'm only soft for her, that's not necessarily uh, a compliment. So, oh my gosh! <laughs> so when you said that, I was gonna say, oh, only soft for her. That sounds like a trope. Um, but that, I mean, I guess it could be, but it wouldn't necessarily, you know. <laughs> Food is a love language. So what kind of food? A French cuisine restaurant with several Michelin stars under his belt. So we've got Mm. traditional French recipes, but we also get a little bit of Chinese in there later in the uh, later in the book and just comfort foods when she's not feeling well. And he'll whip whip something up from scratch just for her, just because. Yeah. Just for his sous chef. There may be a scene involving whipped cream, but you have to read it to find out. That could be a tr- the whipped cream trope. The whipped cream trope. Let's talk heat levels. Where does your novel fit in my alliterative heat meter? Sweet, sexy, steamy, or safe word? Safe word being obviously something with BDSM. 
I'm assuming that doesn't apply to anyone. Steamy. It's a slow burn, but it's steamy. Open door. Gotcha. Well described. It sort of like progresses through the okay. thing. So steamy. Talia, uh, are we talking sweet, sexy, or steamy? Definitely sweet for this one. Um, we're kind of maxed out at kissing. Um, but I did have a reader put on their Instagram story that they were kind of led on by the book and I think I did ask and it seemed to be in a positive way but they said it they oh. had so much sexual chemistry that they thought there was going to be more but then there was just just some sweet sexy kissing but gotcha. we are we're, we're definitely in sweet territory in this right. book and I assume that is because it is a holiday romance so try to keep it uh, more PG I find it interesting that your debut romance is a holiday romance that's that's a bold move because you're taking I mean the holidays holiday romances for many people like that's sacred to them like when they read it a holiday romance like they have the you know expectations did it prove to be a little challenging uh, as your debut so I think it was actually quite helpful in that like I knew I was like okay Christmassy vibes I can do yummy food vibes I can do like wintry cozy like I can do all of that so it was just like setting up like a really sweet and compelling romance in the middle of all of these things that I felt I could really do the setting um although it was kind of by chance that it ended up being a Christmas romance for my first book because I was writing romance anyway and then that um, a friend told me about a competition over here in the UK that was specifically for Christmas romances so I thought oh I could have a go and then that ended up going well I won it and the prize was being published so it kind of nice. was kind of happenstance to be honest but a very very happy happenstance it's all oh, worked out nicely congrats that's that's a cool story. Katrina, sweet, sexy, or steamy? Steamy. We've Ooh. got making out in the walk-in fridge, which may or may not be a health violation. We've got um, we've got a good handful of open door scenes, um, but we've also got sweeter mm -hmm. moments closer to the end. Yeah. We've, right. It's steamy. It's for adults. Yes. Uh, I heard someone told me that they submitted a request to their library and they filed it under teen. And I was like, don't do that. Please don't oh. get me in trouble. It is for adults. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Don't, don't make that mistake. <laughs> so uh, make out in a walk-in freezer could also be. Oh, another trope. Just saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, Joe, uh, sweet, sexy, steamy. This is definitely steamy. Um, I know, you know, with the animated or, or the drawn covers like um you start to think oh it looks so cute it is not cute it is steamy <laughs> there are okay. there are multiple open door uh sex scenes in here okay are any of them like outside you know by an archaeological dig or something not by the um excavation sites but there is mm -hmm. a very sensual waterfall scene waterfall the, the waterfall is prominently featured on the cover because it's a very important scene for them so a waterfall like that could be um a trope too the waterfall trope oh the waterfall sex scene trope. trope you know when you just said the waterfall trope this movie came to mind one of my favorite romantic movies the last of the mohicans oh my gosh you that know what I'm scene, talking about, right? I, I get do. chills just thinking about that scene to this day. My husband and I, we quote that scene all the time when, you know, they're getting ready to, to part and he says, I don't find ye. <laughs> we said that all the time. That's immediately what I thought of when you said waterfall. It is a very, um, like the, the romantic relationships in that movie yeah. are in some ways heartbreaking yeah but also so tender and yeah. loving oh, oh yeah that movie i will find you here's a fun question what is your romance writing superpower Kaya, what is your romance writing superpower I really don't want to step on Katrina's toes because obviously um, your book has a lot to do with food. But I think I have heard from a lot of people that like the 
the food and the eating in my books very you know evocative and cozy and gives like kind of all the vibes um I did used to be a chef so I think there's like a lot like the yeah the food presence is very strong which I think works well especially for a holiday romance and there's some baking together kind of shenanigans going on so I think I think that's strong wow you used to be a chef did you Mm. leave the culinary world to be an author no I've actually gone back to university I love being a chef but I kind of at a very young age I was like oh I can't physically do this anymore and I was like okay what when I'm 30 35 40 like my body's not going to keep up with this so I was like right maybe we retrain for something that I can sit down for like more than 20 minutes a day would be nice Amelia was your romance writing superpower sexual tension sex writing sex scenes um any kind of like uh sexually tinged banter not like Mm -hmm. but it's not like cheesy or anything it's like you know just like sort of that unresolved sexual Mm -hmm. tension resulting in like an amazing sex that's that's what I'm really good at wow wow you said that with with complete confidence you know it's like it's one of those things where it's just like you wonder for a long time then like enough people tell you and finally you're like you know what I actually am really good at this (laughs) good for you okay we're we're doing romance writing superpower who avoided me oh let's see um Katrina. I think I might have one. I'm really good at writing dirty talk. I don't know if it's because I have improv experience. Writing it, like actually talking out loud is a no-go, but writing dirty talk, um, he's very convincing, let's just say in this book. Oh, really? Now, do you use any food puns in the dirty talk? Okay. No, because I think that would just break, break, um, break the readers out of it it depends what foods you're talking about though (laughs) so food and sex so far we've got so now um joe uh what is your romance writing superpower all right so i don't particularly think this but i have been told that raiders is really funny it i wrote it as a rom-com um but I also, when I go back and read it, I'm like, oh my gosh, my jokes are so corny. But people have told me that they were like laughing out loud and how funny it was. And so I'm like, okay, I guess I did actually achieve what I set out to achieve, which was to write something that was funny. (laughs) But, you know, my husband also tells me that I'm not as funny as I think I am. So, you know, I have my imposter syndrome. Like, is it funny? I'm not sure. But I think it is. I think it's funny. Okay. All right. So uh, you're good at at the the calm in the rom. Yes. That's good. That's good because there's a lot of rom-coms that you read and they're very rom, but there's like virtually no calm. So it's good to know that you're bringing the calm. Yes, there is some calm. Definitely. (laughs) Okay. Sometimes it's kind of like corny, corny calm. But that's okay because it still makes you laugh. And that's the whole point of a rom-com is so you laugh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, corny com could be a trope. Nope. All right. Let's get to our book dedications. Who did you dedicate your debut romance novel to and why? And if you could also read the dedication. Talia, who did you dedicate the Christmas swap to and why? And could you please read it? Yes. So the Christmas swap is dedicated to, it says, dedicated to Granny Franny and Grandpa Derek, unwavering supporters. Um, That is my mum's parents. Um, They truly have supported me my entire life. Um, They used to like, you know, I'd write little poems and they'd print them out and they'd make little books of them or I'd write little short stories. So they've always supported the writing dream, but really any dream. When I wanted to be a chef, they bought me a little pasta maker was the thing I really wanted to be cooking. And when I was like, oh, no, you know, I want to do something different then they got me, you know, books associated with that, you know, whatever the dream was, they've just always jumped fully on board and supported it. And I appreciate and love them very much. That is so sweet. Your grandparents, just based on their names, sound adorable. Yeah, (laughs) they're pretty great. 
Katrina, who did you dedicate knives, seasoning, and a dash of love to? So I should probably preface this by saying it's not just a rom-com. There's heart and it deals with um, mental health and burnout. And I actually dedicated this book to myself. Um, my mental health was not in a great place when I wrote this, but it was definitely something that helped me through a particularly hard period of my life. And so the dedication reads, uh, to 25 year old me, I'm glad you're still with us. It really does get better. For those who need it, dial 988 for the suicide and crisis lifeline. You're not alone. And so, yeah, it just sets the tone a little bit that yes, there, there are definitely high moments, but there are definitely moments, uh, moments where you can reflect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Joe. Who did you dedicate Raiders of the Lost Heart to? When I first found out that I was going to be published, I called my mom and dad. Um, and just to give a little bit of background on my parents, my mom actually works at a convent. So I had to warn them. You know, they knew I wrote romance, but I had to warn them, you know, guys, this is kind of, you know, it's a little sexy. And so my dad asks me, and I'll never forget this conversation, we're on speakerphone because they live on the other side of the country. And he goes, now be honest, is your book too spicy for us? And my mom says, oh, I've watched Bridgerton. I think I can handle it. <laughs> so my book is dedicated to my mom and dad. And it says, for Mamo and Dado, I hope it's not too spicy for you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. Amelia, who did you dedicate the stage kiss to? I'm a little salty about my dedication, but it's fine. So I wrote this during the pandemic and um, I had a, a very tight knit writing group at the time and, um, and they helped me a lot with it. So like a lot, like I needed, I needed a musical written and one of them one day, basically the next day she was just like, here's your musical. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Great. And it had all the songs and it had like, you know, kind of like who was in each one. It had duets. It was amazing. One of the other people in my writing group, like took one of those songs, wrote a whole song from it, recorded it, sang it for me and everything. So I wanted to do something for them. Like, so I had like a playbill put into the book, oh. gave them credit for their songs and everything. Um, the reason I'm salty about it is we're no longer a writing group, but the dedication reads for Rompire, you must allow me to remind you how ardently I admire and love you. That is awesome. So you have to put this on, right? You need to like rent a theater and put this yeah, musical on. It's a great musical. <laughs> you know, you can do something online with that though. Seriously, Amelia, where, you know, you get, performers could perform songs from the... Sure. I'm just throwing ideas. I'm the I, idea person. I'm looking guys. out for like the the movie or the like the Netflix series or whatever, but you know, online performances that'll work for me. Like, well, sure. it it starts there. You get attention, then Netflix is That's like, true. you want to buy true. it. What research did you invest into the writing of your debut romances, Amelia? I believe you have something to share. <laughs> Well, I did want to talk about this just because, you know, I have to give major props to this person. So again, I said, like, during the pandemic, I came up with this idea um, to do it based, you know, Pride and Prejudice as like a touring musical. And one of the, I'm a labor and delivery nurse by trade. That's my job. Um, and one of the nurses that I work with, her son is a Broadway actor. And he was in town because he was staying with her through the pandemic. And so I got to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with him because he had been in a touring production and he gave me his touring schedule and everything. We talked about everything, you know, there was to know about like how tours work and like the structure. I didn't know what a standby was because I was it, oh. it, a lot of what he told me informed how I structured the characters and the story and everything. And of course, it's just the requisite, you know, what are the sites to see in Washington, D.C.? And all, all the stuff about like the Lincoln Center. And, um, you know, uh, I have sort of a map of New York in my head all the time. Okay. And um, so, but basically I wanted to give credit to him. His, his name is Peyton Krim and he's wonderful. And he spent so much time with me. They let me in their house during quarantine. And um, wow. so that was fun. So it was like a one-on-one -on -one, uh, source material. 
So wow. I think my editor, Jess Birdie, is also a former uh, Broadway person too. So we were like a little match made in heaven. So she was able to correct a lot of things that I messed up. Very cool. Does anyone else have any any like, research on snakes or research on, you know, working in a kitchen that you would like to share? Yes, Joe. Uh -huh. So um, Raiders of the Lost Heart uh, focuses on the search for Aztec artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, and I really wanted the main character of the book to have a connection to what they were searching for. Because when you think about the adventure genre, it's usually a white man who's searching for some artifacts in some country or in some culture that is not their own. And so I really wanted to her to have a tie to that. Um, I am Mexican. And so I have always been really fascinated by the Aztecs. And so I did a lot of research about the Aztecs for this book because I wanted to make sure I was being culturally sensitive. Um, you know, they're one of the artifacts that they're looking for is one of the sacrificial knives that the Aztecs used to use. And so I wanted to make sure that I handled that subject um, with respect because it's it's something that, you know, today we think about human sacrifice um, as being this really awful thing, but it was something that was very important to the Aztecs um, because it was something that they did to appease the gods and make sure that their lands were fertile. Mm -hmm. And they, um, you know, it was a very important religious ritual for them. So I did a ton of research on the Aztecs for this book, even though not uh, much of it is necessarily in the book, but it kind of yeah. uh, helps to set the stage for Chamali, the um, the ancestor of the main character. Um, however, now that we're working on the audio and the audio people are coming to me asking how to pronounce all these words, I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> they yeah. have some very long words, some very interesting words, but I mean, just their names, you know, Moctezuma, right. um, Tlan, I mean, those are not words that you hear in everyday um, dialogue. And so right. that has been kind of fun, um, just myself trying to make sure I understand how those words are pronounced. Right. Talia, was, was there any research that you did? Um, not anything hugely specific. I mean, it is set in a manor house in Cheshire. I can't imagine that any of you would know much about Cheshire. I also didn't. It's just out in the countryside. So I kind of had to make sure I knew where everything was geographically. Um, for the most part, they do a lot of baking and eating. I've done a lot of baking and eating. That's my long-term research I did for my big <laughs> holiday book. That's truly the most intensive research that went into it was eating. <laughs> that, that's awesome. I mean, research should be fun. Katrina, was there any research that you did? Um, I definitely put in extra research looking up recipes. I think yeah. I go into great detail throughout the book, specific step-by-steps, really get those. Um, I, I focused a lot on aromatics. I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, there was also a section. I did a lot of research about knives specifically, German knives, Japanese knives. And it's just, well, it's in the title. So it's very important in the book. <laughs> Right. You might be on a few watch lists. And I know. They look at your oh, internet uh, search history. They're like, we got to watch this one. <laughs> the FBI agent in my, yeah, in my computer is just like, <laughs> all right. Now, did you try any of the, because this is French cuisine. So, and this is like, you know, highfalutin type of, you know, <laughs> did you try making any of that or? No. So I watch, um, it's a YouTube channel called Binging with Babish. Oh, I, I don't know. Oh, Talia, you're familiar? She's I am, yeah. yeah. Um, so I got a couple recipes off of him just watching him. I watched a couple of documentaries of like this French competition to get, um, I think it's called like a blue ribbon or something. And it's the most elite oh. uh, cooking competition to say that, yes, I am a chef. And yeah, uh, it's just really intense. So I did, that's sort of how I went about my research. Um, and obviously a lot of 
the restaurant aspects of the book just pulled from my own experience working in the food industry when I was younger. Right. Uh, Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I think you've earned the fun segment. I have frequently played this title needs a story on my other shows, but I decided to change it to this story needs a title. I have five stories, just very brief, like one line about these stories. And you just come up with a title. Who's going to lock eyes with me first? Uh, Katrina. (laughs) What number would you like from one to five? Oh, just give me number one. Okay. Number one, sci-fi romance between an alien and a human who meet at Comic Con. No, I want to go something like, I'm, I'm just going to spitball here. Go ahead. Comic-Con, cosplaying. Um, uh-huh. Oh, no. Cosplayers. I don't know. <laughs> Cos- ah, okay. Is, is, that what, is that your final answer? Is cosplay? Yeah. <laughs> Cos could be like cosmic, so we can put it in like <gasps> a spacey font to allude to the alien. Yes. And then players is just like. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, players, yeah. Suggestive, you know? Right. You know, oh. is that why you picked cause? Because you were thinking cosmic and then cosplay? No, I just, I know that at Comic-Con, cosplay is a really big yeah. thing. But it, but it makes sense worldly. for cause, yeah. for cosmic. That's really good. Okay. I like it. I dig it. Okay. So we have two, three, four, and five left. Amelia. Uh, number two. Oh, we're going to go in order. Go in order. Huh? Go in order. A friends to lovers romance between best friends who fall in love during a road trip to their college reunion. Oh, okay. Um, our old school. Oh, what was that? Our old school. Our old school. Our old school. I don't know. <laughs> I I love the premise though. Oh, our so many- old school. Our old school. I I really like that premise. Like I could write that. Well, I was going to say when we were done, you know, playing that if you decide to use any of the titles or the stories, just throw me Liz Donatelli. uh, I thank you in the acknowledgments and it's yours and I won't sue you. Well, I use this. I said like, so I have this Steely Dan song. It's like uh, the Steely Dan is one of my favorites. Like I grew up with it, but it's uh, Guadalajara won't do now, but I'll never it's like it's, it's called my old school. So I just thought our old school. How old? Okay, so you've got to. Okay, see, I, I'm, I know that there's a. It was my, it was my free again. association. I, okay. I would come up with something better, but that would be my working title. <laughs> I, I dig it. See, because you explain kind of your thought process, and now I'm, I'm along for the ride. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have three, four, and five left. Joe, what number would you like? I'm gonna go with five. Oh, I thought you might decide not to go in order. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna change it up. Okay, this one. As I wrote it, I was like, I don't even know. I'm I hope nobody picks this one because it's gonna be hard. Oh gosh. No, no, no. I Great. <laughs> I mean, not really. Actually, it sounds kind of interesting. An enemies to lovers romance between two former reality dating TV contestants who are now living in the same small town. Hmm. How about Showmance, no mance. Showmance, no mance. <laughs> I am not good at titles. <laughs> so no mance would be referring to what? No, I don't know, because they're enemies. Like okay. no. But then it makes it sound like there's no romance though. Oh, I see. So showmance, but no mance, because it's like I don't want a mance with you. Right. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, not you know. I think it could work. I think it could work. I'm gonna I'm gonna ruminate on that one for a yeah, bit. Yeah, think about that. Um. Okay. So we have three. Oh boy, we have three or four left. Talia. Oh, these are some good. Oh, ones. I'll go with number four. Oh, I was hoping you'd say this. A polyamorous paranormal romance between a lion shifter, a witch, and a warlock. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, right? It just it, it fires all the synapses. It's, I mean, it's so exciting, but it's it's hard because obviously Nani is already there, so I'm trying to think of something yeah. new. It's difficult. Um, 
why hasn't anyone done some kind of, you know, lion shifter, uh, wish in a word of some kind of take on Narnia? Unless they do. I don't know. I know. Someone here is going to have to write this. Uh, I can't even think of like anything. There's too many things there that I can't. I mean, maybe the chronicles of something. The chronicles Aww. of. I know. Can, can everyone everyone want to kind of pitch in? Maybe we can. Yeah. Does like... anyone have anything? I was going to be really... like into the wardrobe. I don't know. Like, <laughs> into <laughs> So something with the wardrobe into it. Um, about the chronicles of hornia mm. <laughs> oh yeah. so this is gonna have to be like a safe word book the chronicles because there's like wardrobe play this wardrobe play whatever that means mm. sounds like a thing it's a trope it's a trope oh you know it's a trope joe you know it's a trope we could have like three out of the wardrobe or three out of the closet or something like that like, that's true obviously you'd be exploring queerness if you were yes in, maybe out uh, of the wardrobe hmm Something like that. Something going on. Maybe. I don't know. That one is really hard. <laughs> Thank you for being good sports and playing. This story needs a title. This was the first time it was ever played. So it might be the only time. Also, <laughs> I don't know. Thank you, Amelia, Katrina, Talia, and Joe for joining me here on First Date. I wish all of you continued sex. <laughs> continued sex. That too. Um, I I'll, wish, take that. I'll take that wish. <laughs> I wish all of you continued success and happy writing. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much.